So we're very pleased to work with them and presenting every year something about Wilmington's history. Uh, this year, as you know, the program is focusing on our bond, the Wilmington's uh, bond collection. And many of you know the story that uh, Mr. Bond wanted to write a history of Wilmington and was turned down by a town meeting and promptly left town with a very valuable collection. And only a few, it was a few years ago that uh, the town was able to buy the collection from a private dealer. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you one of the people that was very instrumental in getting that collection back to Wilmington, the chairman of the Historical Commission, Carolyn Harris. Thank you, Tina, and members of the Friends of the Library and uh, guests this evening. I'm overwhelmed at how many people are here um, to uh, enjoy this public display of the Bond Collection. This is a project that has um, resulted from the efforts of the Historical Commission and really through the uh, very hard work of a very special person and that person is Kathleen Reynolds who is the new curator of the Hardin Tavern and the Wilmington Town Museum. Um, I thought to start the program, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background as to how this bond collection came back to Wilmington. Um, as Tina indicated to you, uh, Mr. Bond had um, wished to write a book and he thought a book about 800 pages would be nice and he brought it before uh, the town fathers in I think it was 1902 or thereabouts and they really couldn't fund it. They really thought it was a good idea, but they really couldn't fund the project. And uh, Kathleen is going to go into a lot more detail on um, Arthur T. Bond. And um, she's done a considerable amount of research. So we found out uh, a lot of information about him that wasn't generally known. And he did remain in town for a long time before he left. So he really didn't leave in a huff. You're not going to print my book and I'm out of here kind of thing. And that was kind of nice to know. Um, he truly was a, a historian. He truly loved history and um, he was a collector of an incredible amount of historical artifacts and photographs and documents, all of which I'm, I'm really happy to say are back in Wilmington. Um, the story really goes back to February of 1997 when I received a telephone call from Adele Passmore. And I, I think Adele is here somewhere, and, and she said, Carolyn, you'll never guess what happened. I just heard from, and I thought she had won the lottery. She was that excited. I've never heard her that excited. We have to have this. You have to do something about it. You wait till you see what's included in this collection. So we invited uh, Mr. Stuart Goldman, who was the owner of the collection, who had purchased it somewhere in New Hampshire, and had realized when he opened the boxes exactly what he had, and it all pertained to Wilmington, and, and brought it to us, to our attention. So we invited him to a historical commission meeting. And, you know, after talking to Adele, uh, there was a bit of excitement, you know, oozing out of, out of myself, but I'm, I'm kind of reserved. I couldn't really believe that this existed. And I thought I won the lottery when I looked at it. It was absolutely incredible. So the next step, like anything else, is a price tag to it. And we felt that the people of Wilmington should take a look at what this collection included. So we had a public exhibit in July of 1997, and it was really well attended. We had hundreds of people come through and take a look at um, the collection that you all have an opportunity, if you have not already, to see later this evening. I was astounded and I was so happy that so many people from the town of Wilmington came up to me and said, if you can't buy it, we'll raise some money for you. Or I'll buy it and you can pay me back a little at a time. That's how 
people felt once they looked at these documents. This is truly the heritage of the town of Wilmington. And I was just, I was so pleased that people were willing to do this. We went before the Finance Committee, and as citizens of Wilmington, um, you can be sure the Finance Committee is doing its job. It was like, and, and I laugh about it now, it was like the Great Inquisition. You know, they wanted to make absolutely sure there was a need and what was included and so forth, and, and those men and women are doing their job on your behalf. But once they realized, they did, and we're very thankful to all of them for supporting the purchase of the bond collection. So the collection came home in September of 1997 and came here to the library. We then decided, obviously, to take a look piece by piece at what we had here. And I was very fortunate to have Laurel Toole from the library staff come in and work with me sort of as a preliminary um, uh, look at what we had and to begin to catalog in general terms what was included because there was so many primary sources, so many documents. And we just realized at that point that this is a mammoth job. It is something that just can't be done, you know, every other week or um, when time allows. So therefore, I went back to the Historical Commission. And I'm lucky I work with the greatest group of, of men and women in the town because they, they always say, oh, here she comes with another project. And I said, who would like to work on this project? And Kathleen Reynolds, who had been a member of the commission for a while and still maintained a close relationship with the commission working on various uh, projects, for example, putting the plaque program on a database and an ongoing project was, which was recently completed that you will see this evening if you don't already have. I know some of you have that pamphlet in your hands, a brand new map of the historical uh, points of interest in Wilmington. The one thing about Kathleen, and I said to her, your name should appear on it. So I hope this evening as you pick up your brochure on the town of Wilmington, you will run up to Kathleen and have her autograph it for you. It would have been a lot easier if she just put her name on it because truly she has worked on this project for well over a year and has done a, a, a wonderful job. Uh, another project that um, she has worked on has been uh, helping with the uh, printing of the town engineers, the original town engineers report. So she was very active and she said, you know, I think I'd really like to work on that collection. She had seen it when we first brought it to Wilmington and as a historian, uh, she really wanted to do this job and we said, Kathleen, we'd love to have you do it. Um, to support this, we applied for a grant to the Bay State Historical League and received a grant um, basically to inventory. Uh, the collection, and that is what you are seeing this evening, the bond collection completely inventoried. There's more work to be done on it, as Kathleen will explain, in terms of making it available for use for um, historical purposes, for research and so forth. Um, while this is all going on, Another goal of the Historical Commission came to fruition, and that was the creation of a Wilmington Town Museum. Um, the Hardin Tavern has uh, a section on it that had been used as rental uh, property, as a caretaker for the museum. And it was decided by the town that maybe we should take a look at, because of the overwhelming historical interest in the Bond collection and in the various historical programs we've been working, to create a town museum for the people of Wilmington. And in order to have a museum, we obviously needed a curator, and I was very thankful that Kathleen was one of those candidates um, that applied for that position. And after an extensive search um, and a series of interviews, she was chosen as our new curator for the Hyden Tavern and Museum. She has her history degree from Bentley College and is currently a candidate for a master's degree in museum studies at Tufts University. And she brings an incredible amount of enthusiasm to the history of Wilmington. And I think you're really going to enjoy her presentation this evening. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Kathleen Reynolds.
Thank you. Um, thank you, Carolyn, for that wonderful introduction, all that praise. Um, I hope I deserve your applause after the presentation. Um, I also want to thank Tina Stewart for the invitation to um, show off this collection because it really is fantastic. I also want to thank the friends for um, their wonderful pies and refreshments that will be available after the presentation, so please do enjoy those. A um, couple of people that I would like to thank for their help um, in identifying some of the photographs and articles in the presentation, Paul Shalifor, uh, Adele Passmore, and Brian Berghaus for his assistance in getting everything organized. Um, I'm going to talk. Um, I think, I hope everybody has a copy of the program. If not, they're available on the back table. Um, we'll go through these documents. Maybe not all of them. We'll see how time goes. Um, because I'd like to save some time at the end for some questions and answers, which I encourage you to have. Um, first, I want to start with a story. Um, this is a story about myself when I was a, an intern at the Museum of Our National Heritage um, as a research assistant to the Director of Education. And he sent me out on an assignment to um, research events as they unfolded on April 19, 1775 uh, in Lexington at the Battle of Lexington Green. And I thought, okay, this will be interesting. I didn't really have a, a large revolutionary period background uh, in history. And so I thought, okay, I'll you know, scout the local libraries. I went to Lexington and Lincoln and Concord. And one library in particular caught my attention, and I'll never forget this experience. Um, I went in there, I went to the circulation desk and asked uh, where the information on the revolutionary period was. And I needed primary sources. And she looked at me and she picked up the telephone on her desk and she mumbled into it very quietly and kept looking at me and nodded very seriously, hung up the phone and she just pointed to a room over there and I sort of interpreted that as that's where you need to go. So off to this room I go and um, I waited there. I didn't knock on the door or anything. The door was locked. It was glassed in. It was a dim room. And all of a sudden, the door opened, and a very stoic-looking woman appeared and didn't say anything to me, uh, just sort of escorted me in. So I walk in. You know, here I am with my backpack, college student. You know what we're like. And uh, so I stand there, and I'm waiting for her to say, OK, this is what you need. This is where to look. Here's the page to turn to. Get out your notebook and pencil. She didn't do any of that. She let me in, closed the door behind me, exited through another door. So here I am in this dimly lit room, noticing the surveillance cameras in the corners of the room, <laughs> looking around at the intimidating shelves and books on those shelves, and just stood there for a moment, taking it all in, afraid to move, worried that I was going to be uh, in the presence of a general from the you know, Redcoats interrogating me. He didn't know what to think. And um, decided to be a little more curious and walked over to the shelves and looked at the books and said, oh, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is great. Uh, so I took a couple of books off the shelves and I started looking through them and finally got comfortable at this beautiful table, nice, comfortable chair, took out my pencil and notebook and just started perusing the books. And these were beautiful books and they were a lot like what you'll see here tonight, the documents in particular, old manuscript, you know, mm -hmm dull, torn papers, very interesting to me. My very first experience with primary sources, and I, was, I got very excited. So I struggled to read a couple of them because, you know, back then, way back then, uh, they wrote in Old English sometimes, and a lot of times it's hard to decipher that quill and pen. So I struggled through the first couple, and then I get, I get the hang of it. So I'm there about 15, 20 minutes, and I finally have the hang of it, and I'm reading through them now. And then it dawns on me what it is that I'm reading, and I just stopped caught my breath. My heart was racing like it is right now because I'm nervous, but uh, and I, I just stood there or sat there and, and looked at this document and thought, oh my goodness, I don't believe what I'm reading. This is amazing. What I was reading was accounts of those events on Lexington Green on April 19, 1775, actual accounts written by men, but they were British men. They weren't American soldiers. They were British soldiers. So everything that I had been taught about the American Revolution up to that point went pss, right out the window. Here I am reading a whole new account, a whole new perspective of what happened that day in that particular place here in Lexington. Lexington, Massachusetts it just blew me away. So why do I tell you that story? What does that have to do with Arthur Thomas Vaughan and his collection? A lot of what's in here are those types of sources, primary sources. And I hope, as you peruse them yourselves, turn the pages, you'll get that same reaction that I got. You'll catch your breath and say, 
I never realized that. Oh my goodness, that's not what I was taught. That's not what I learned. Or maybe something that you've been told year after year, decade after decade, has been denied by so many other people, but yet you're reading it here, factually, in a primary source. I hope that's what you get out of this collection because I got that experience many times in this collection here. Okay, so that's my story. Off we go. If you turn to the, this page here, <laughs> the scribble, what looks like scribble. Um, this is a, um, a letter written by a Levi S. Gould of Melrose, Massachusetts, to Arthur Thomas Bond in 1898. You can see that it's dated. And on the fourth page of that document, it's signed by Levi S. Gould. This is a perfect example of a primary source. And at the bottom, I've given it a title, Earliest Intelligent Recollections of Wilmington. Isn't that nice? How eloquent. This is how Levi Eskund responded to what I think was a question posed to the older families, older citizens of Wilmington. Um, he, I, I believe he posed a question, what was life like for you growing up in Wilmington? And that's a wonderful way to, to really understand what life was like a long time ago. Um, <coughs> Don't be surprised if you receive a similar request from me in the mail anytime soon. That's why I had to sign the guest book so I can send you a letter asking for those same questions. Um, I'd like to read something from that, if I may, because it is hard to get used to that type of writing. But here he goes. Dear Bond, my recollections of town of Wilmington date from the earliest intelligent thoughts of childhood. I remember that we occupied the little white house, which now stands nearly opposite the railroad station at South Wilmington. I remember where the electric railway turns to go to Reading. The house known as the Old Moral Homestead and a house in which Dr. Abner Toothaker afterwards resided many years. My ABCs were learned in a very small building which stood in the center. It would not accommodate more than a dozen or 15 pupils. I remember very well good old Deacon Cadwallader Morrill, who ran a shop adjacent to the old sawmill which flourished in the days when the people had logs to treat. A still more ancient grist mill stood on the other side of the road with its raceway and overshot wheel was a most interesting relic of a previous century. How well I remember the old cracker bakery and Captain Joseph Bond, his sons and grandsons. Opposite the cracker bakery was a hill surmounted by a powder house, a relic, I suppose, of the times preceding the revolution. This powder house was always a subject of awe to the children as they were warned of the danger from explosion of its contents. Never drawn upon, however, excepting the 4th of July. Isn't that nice? Um, he goes on in the rest of the letter to talk about other families and other landmarks. The reason I bring this letter to your attention is because it's, it's a wonderful example of a primary source. It lists names, it lists landmarks, it lists houses and industry. And we may have read about these similar topics in, in local history books or have been told them by um, people who are older than us and uh, pass down those stories. But this is an actual resource that tells us about them. And this, this can be used as factual information. So it's a great, great letter in that, in that sense. And there's a few of these. And I put them in a notebook. And, they're, and it's in, um, subtitled Conversations. And what Mr. Bond did was he went around town and talked with the older families in Wilmington. And he took notes. He, probably asked him certain questions, what do you remember about such and such a thing, and people, and this, that, and the other thing. He spoke with a Mrs. Ames, a Mrs. Gowing, I believe a Carter, the older families in Wilmington, to really record their history, what they remember. So that's an interesting document for that reason. And if you have the chance to look at it for real in the notebook, I, I hope, again, you'll get that inkling of, ooh, how exciting. The next document. is a deed dated 1713. Bear in mind, that's several years before Wilmington was incorporated. Um, and I show it to you for a couple of reasons. One of them is because it's the oldest document in the collection. It took me almost a year to find this document. <laughs> and I finally found it, and I, again, I was very excited. Um, it's a deed, a transfer of land in Woburn, spelled just as it's written there, W-O-O-B-O-R-N-E, near Settle Meadow Brook. And we know Settle Meadow Brook here in Wilmington. From Simon Thompson to Giles Robards of Woburn. Now, according to Bond, who kept meticulous notes, and I want to thank him for that because it was really made my job a little bit easier. Um, Simon Thompson has very little physical evidence available about him. 
So there's not a lot of paperwork, there's not a lot of photographs, things like that. But now we have a document signed by him, sealed by him, in our possession. It's wonderful. Uh, in addition, he was um, a descendant in some sense. I believe he was a nephew of this Count Rumford, whom we know of Rumford Historical Society in Woburn. Another important document. Okay, and the next document will be the 1850 voter list. And I like this document because it lists a number of the, um, probably all of the, at least all of the families are represented on this document. It's an 1850 voter list. You'll no recognize the names Ames, Carter, Buck, Jaquith, Gowing, Swain, and many others. But I like it in particular because of who is not on it. And I'm going to post that to you. Who won't you find on this list? Women, very good. That's right. Another document to our time. It's wonderful. Imagine a young high school student coming in when these documents are available for research purposes. And you know, yeah, sure, okay, maybe it'll be 2020 and this young high school student comes in and realizes, what do you mean we didn't get the vote for, you know, 100 years ago? Well, she's going to have or he's going to have proof that, you know, it really actually happened in here in Wilmington. You know, it's wonderful. Wonderful. So, those are three examples of primary sources um, found in, in the collection. And I stress primary source because, again, this is unadulterated, uninterpreted history. This is it. This is the real thing. You know, this is not somebody taking it and putting their spin on it. This is actual, real fact, and it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. But now you want to hear about Bond, right? We'll get on to Mr. Arthur Thomas Bond. On the next page, you'll see two pictures of him. One where it states he was known as Bond of Boston, but now he's Wilmington's Bond, as the friends so lovely dubbed him. Um, and that picture was taken, I believe, around 1880, and there's another one uh, taken of him in 1930 in, in a Masonic outfit. Um, there were earlier photographs available of him in the collection, but they're in a bound copy, and I didn't want to risk damaging the binding, so I didn't copy it. But you can see it. It's in a nice black bound book. Um, he's got a very full mustache and darker hair, and he looks a little bit younger. So that's him. He was the son of Olive and Thomas Bond. Um, he lived or grew up in what is now the St. Thomas Rectory. That house was built in 1854. Arthur Thomas was born in 1852, so he lived most of his life in that house. Um, in 1920, that particular house became the residence for priests of the, um, and was bought by the Archdiocese of Boston. Arthur Thomas Bond was schooled at Phillips Academy in Andover. The house school in Billerica. Is anyone here from Billerica? Aha, have you heard of the house school, Mr. Hull? No. no. And neither had I. And I almost didn't mention it tonight, except on the front page of the Lowell Sun the other day was an article about this man, how, and his endowment to educate boys. And I thought, there we go. We know we have actual proof that somebody in Wilmington was educated through his endowment. And I didn't read the whole article. So I hope it wasn't scandalous. <laughs> and he graduated from Williams College in 1873. I believe he worked for the Bond Cracker Baking Factory for about, or business at that point, for about two years, but then went on to establish his own successful advertising agency in Boston on Central Street. Um, and again, as his business card states, he was Bond of Boston or Boston's Bond. That's what he liked to be known as. In 1873, he married Minnie Dorr, and together they had one daughter. They divorced in 1885. The divorce decree, which you'll see in the collection, was issued from a Michigan court in 1885, and on it, it claimed that he deserted his wife. Now, 1885, you know, it's over 100 years ago. Desertion back then could mean what irreconcilable differences mean today. So there needs to be a little bit of research into what that exactly meant. However, in terms of their daughter, he was denied any type of care, custody, education of her at all. And it's, in, from what I've learned, he didn't see or speak to her again. So that's a little tragedy there. Um, in 1887, he went on to marry Miss Sophia Hamblin of Wakefield. And... Um, 
Carolyn Harris just recently went to uh, the Wakefield Cemetery, Lakeside Cemetery in Wakefield, and found their cemetery plot. And uh, that's pretty exciting. I can't wait to go see it myself. But uh, on the tombstone, I believe, it's a family tombstone, and it's listed all these Hamlins, Hamblins, and then you'll see Bond at the bottom of it. I think that's really kind of neat. So that'll be interesting to see. In 1889, he built a house in Wilmington, and you'll see it here. It still exists. Beautiful house at 482 Middlesex Avenue. And I'm very happy to report that the owners of that house, Mr. and Mrs. Larry and Jean Doucette, have donated a blueprint of that house, an original blueprint. And you'll see it up on the wall there. And then um, Larry had taken a picture of the house 110 years later. So you'll see the contrast. But it looks exactly the same. There is no contrast. It's exactly the same. So thank you, Larry, for that. I appreciate it. Let's see, so he built that house, and there he lived for 25 years, which defies what we had believed before we had gotten through all this collection. We thought after 1906, when he was denied funding for his history, that he packed up and left. But he didn't. He remained in Wilmington another eight years. He lived there until 1914. So he wasn't as embittered as we thought. Um, so that's good to know. And from there, I don't know where they went. He and his wife remained married until their deaths. Um, it's possible they went to Melrose or Wakefield. The next record I have available for him is in 1927, and there's an article in um, a paper, a newspaper, congratulating he and his wife on their 40th wedding anniversary. That was in 1927, and it was a Chestnut Hill location that they were listed at. So they lived in Chestnut Hill. And whether or not they went there right after Wilm Wilmington, I'm not sure. However, during his stay here in Wilmington, he became a member of the New England Genealogical Society while researching his family's genealogy, and this he did extensively as well. He, was, he liked to do things very thoroughly, and for that I'm grateful. And you'll see some of that genealogical information over there and a lot of the records. Um, and up until very close to his death, he still was making notes on these records. He was still researching them. Same thing with the, the Wilmington records. On backs of photographs, you can see how his handwriting grew older. And uh, he was just very much into this. And despite how the town felt or wouldn't fund it, it, it was still in him. He wanted to preserve the history. He wanted to get the word out. Um, and I'm glad he did. In 1898, he began photographing the historic sites and researching their history. The historic sites at that point would have been homes or landmarks that had been here since the incorporation or even earlier. And some of them, if you'll see on the next page, after his house, there's a picture of the Samuel Wright estate. And this house was originally on High Street. It's no longer there. And according to Bond's notes, you can read them. It says, originally a square house. And the, the notations he made are just wonderful, later owned by Dr. Jabez Brown and Henry Blanchard. Um, in 1898, he says it was known as the residence of Mrs. Moore, formerly Harris, Henry Blanchard. You can see just the information, how thorough he was. He enjoyed doing this, certainly. Um, but the reason I, I wanted to show that, that particular picture to you was this fall, the Historical Commission got an inquiry from a woman in New York researching the Wright family. And she mentioned Samuel Wright and his wife's name, gave us, um, or gave the commission information on their marriage, and that was all she had on them. So I took that letter and I said, okay, let me verify the information. I went to the vital records in the bicentennial room, verified what she had told us, and had nowhere else to go. And I looked through all the books in there and I couldn't find anything on them. And I thought, oh, how sad. I, I hate to disappoint people. And I didn't want to write back to her and say, gee, I can't help you any further. Let me go back to organizing the bond collection. So back I go. So I'm flipping through the bond collection pages, and doesn't this jump right out at me? There again. <gasps> I lost my breath. My heart raced. I ran to the copier. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. Not just that, yes, this is where this so-and-so lived, Mr. Wright lived, but the land passed down to this person, and in this state, and there were so many acres sold. So she could use that information and go further with it. So this is a wonderful example how valuable this collection is, and I don't think we're realizing it until now. And if you look at the next page, this is another reason. And of course, I've, it's identified as the Silas Brown Place. I've identified it at the, as the Colonel Joshua Herndon Tavern, which is exactly what it is. This picture was taken again around 1898, but it's a rare photograph. 
It shows the tavern in a rare state. If you, if you look on the left side of the picture, you'll see the L, the northern L that we've heard and read so much about. But we really don't have any other information on it other than knowing that it was there. Now we have a picture of it. The front porch, look at how pretty that is. The front fence on the uh, extension or the wing of the house. And look at how narrow Route 62 and Salem Street are there. <laughs> look at that, isn't that nice? And look at the grade of the hill. And that tree, of course, is no longer there, but that grade of the hill, the house actually set up on a small hill. Now, you know, we're collecting dust and rocks from the street, from Hepron going back and forth, no. Um, anyway, another wonderful example of how useful this collection is and will be because we've just scratched the surface, I'm afraid. Okay. So that's, that's what Bond did in 1898. He went around and took some historical photographs, um, researched the house, the property owners, and other things. Um, by 1904, he amassed enough information to publish a book, which you'll find on the next page, the souvenir and guidebook. I wonder what types of souvenirs he had. I really do. Ooh, did he have like a Whitfield Elm and a Baldwin Apple Monument? I bet LeDuc's has some of those souvenirs. <laughs> uh, I believe that this publication that he put together uh, was a preview to what he wanted to publish. And I believe this is what he showed to the selectmen and to the town. Uh, and he could have he could have accumulated uh, a much larger volume. And in fact, in the town records, it says he could have published an 800-page volume of the Wilmington's history. That's a rather large volume. Um, however, he came up six votes short of getting the funding to write his book and publish his history. Um, but he went on to speak about the history of Wilmington. He exhibited information whenever he could. In fact, one of the notebooks with all the pictures of the houses in it, you can see he's got lists of how he wanted things exhibited. It's kind of nice. Um, so whenever he could, he, he wrote about it, he spoke about it, he exhibited it. And um, even in 19, 1930, when he was 78, 19, yeah, 78, he and his wife were invited back as guests of the town for their 200th anniversary celebration of the town's incorporation. And there he gave another speech, and I'm sure it was on the history of Wilmington. So how embittered he was, how disappointed he was, is not really known until we get to his will. <laughs> because in his will, he, um, he didn't make any mention of his collection whatsoever, and, and it would make sense to me as an amateur historian, that if he wanted this collection to be cherished and saved and preserved and used the way that he used it, he would have donated it to the town, but he didn't. He didn't make any mention of it in his will whatsoever. Um, if you turn the next page, I'd like to talk a little bit about his will and his estate, um, because they, too, are important documents. Um, he died in 1936 on January 1st, and he and his second wife had no children. So the majority of their, both of their estates went to two of his second wife's nieces. And it was in a, a substantial estate. He had uh, money to give. He had security, stocks, things like that. This list, and I know you can barely read it, but when you struggle through it, you'll be able to decipher it. Um, it lists a lot of jewelry, um, but it's a statement. It's a testament to what he had in his possession when he died, what his lifestyle was like. It's important for that reason. Um, and it's signed by one of the nieces, which I think is important, Sarah T. Moeller. And there's a lot of correspondence in the collection between his executor and this woman and the other niece. And, you know, well, I need $500. Can I have an advance on my, my, um, my gift? And, you know, the lawyer would send off a, a an advance. Oh, and my sister should get the same amount because after all she got the other half and really interesting stuff. And I mentioned his will again because he didn't leave his collection to anybody in particular. Um, and we don't know how it got up to New Hampshire, but it did. And there's one gift that I think is very generous of him. He left a house that he owned in, Wilming in Wellesley to one man. He left a house in Wellesley with all the furnishings, all the furniture, whatever was there was this man's. Believe me, I've tried to call him, and he's, he's no longer there. Uh, so I think what could have happened was this man who inherited this house 
possibly moved to New Hampshire uh, and brought the collection with them, and that's how it ended up at the, at the antiques dealer. I don't really know. That's not clear. But again, once we do some more delving, maybe we'll find the, um, the real answer. The last document I want to talk about is about the woman on the last page. This is Mr. Bond's sister, Lizzie, who married a um, very successful felt manufacturer from Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And here she is pictured on her wedding day. And the reason I mention her is because she too left a will, and it is in the collection. And she and her husband were very, very generous when they died. Unlike Mr. Bond, however, she left money to Wilmington's church, the Congregational Church, in her parents' name. She left money to the cemetery department to upkeep their plot in the um, Wildwood Cemetery. Um, she left her parents' china to an organization in Boston called the Colonial Dames of America, which is a philanthropic and a preservationist-oriented organization. So she, too, had preservation and, and historic um, significance in mind when she passed on. Their biggest gift, however, um, possibly was to the Boston Children's Hospital. It was a gift of $500,000 in 1929. They had no children and yet they left this amount of money to a children's hospital. I thought that was very touching. And as you can see, that concludes my program. And I just, again, want to reiterate that this collection is loaded with wonderful information, and I hope that you have the chance to go through it and really try to read some of the documents and maybe find something that's of interest to you. There's something for everybody in this collection, absolutely something for everybody in this collection, and I hope you en enjoy it as much as I do, and will continue to do, because there's still some work done. I'd like to open, um, or take this opportunity to take any questions that you may have. Promise to go easy on me, because I don't have a lot of answers, but maybe I'll surprise myself. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question. Much of what he did was copy from original records. This was a meticulous man who liked to do things like this. And he, he writes right on it copies of original church records, copies of baptisms in the congregational church, and he says, compiled by Arthur T. Bond. So he made handwritten copies and then would go on and make typewritten copies. He wanted people to know what it was that he was collecting. He really did. Yes? There, um, there are several documents, several bound copies of information, and you'll find them in the Bicentennial Room, and you can get in there, you know, you can ask downstairs at the library, um, the circulation desk, and they'll give you um, a pass, and you have to sign in, and you can get in. But there are vital records in there. There are lists of persons listed in a certain date, um, town records from, uh, I don't know if they go as far back as 1730, but they go, they go far back. There are, you know, uh, high school yearbooks. There's information, not just town information, but there's information on like the Middlesex Canal, the Minutemen have some wonderful records in there. I believe all the state records, state, not state records, but city records are in there. The books, each individual city is in there. Um, so yeah, the, the library has a wonderful collection. Um, and another inquiry that the Wilmington Historical Commission had over the summer was from a um, a television station out in Hollywood, California, and they were inquiring about uh, the Minutemen or the, the militia that um, served in the American Revolution. And they wanted to know any information about Wilmington that the commission had, particularly on that April 19th date. And so I took that and went crazy because I had all the records from the Bond collection. And I didn't just stay with 1775. I went from 1761, the earliest document I could find, up until 1791, and I copied um, a book, a bound book in there, um, and it's a biography of each Minuteman. I copied that. Any information on the Minutemen I could find, I sent off. So Wilmington is going to be known, it really is, um, for its military history, for this Bond collection, just for the amount of documents that are in here. Did that answer your question? Great. Anybody else? No? Okay, well, if there are no more questions at this time, feel free to, you know, I'll be here 
of course, until the remainder of the program. But you know, feel free to ask me any of the questions as we're um, perusing the um, the books and documents over here. And with Carolyn Harris, I would like to help her disperse the historical home plaques, which we're very happy um, to do because it's a wonderful program and we're very pleased that so many people have come forward to participate in it. These are plaques that um, historical homeowners will hang on the outside of their homes. So as you're driving by, you can see whose house it was and when it was built. And if you think your home uh, should deserve one of these plaques, please let the commission know. We just need verification of the, of the uh, home's eligibility and, and we can get you a plaque. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Um, and I just have uh, one further comment that I would like to make, and that is um, now that we have a Wilmington Town Museum, that the Bond Collection will become the nucleus to that museum, and it will be on display at the Town Museum. Um, once we have finished some renovations we're currently working on um, with the Buildings Department and the Public Works Department and we're very, very grateful to the town for their support in the creation of this museum for the people of Wilmington. One of the um, new collections that we have acquired for the town museum is the Spanos photographs um, from World War II and um, they are presently housed at the museum and there have been a lot of interest in people wishing to see those and certainly you could give Kathleen a call at her new place of work and um, if you would like to take a look at them prior to them being on display I'm sure that can be arranged and um, I guess I'll turn this microphone over to Tina and um, once again I uh, wish to thank you for inviting the Historical Commission and uh, Kathleen for displaying uh, the work on the Bond Collection. We are truly excited to have this back in Wilmington. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Kathleen. I'm sure you all enjoyed the presentation. And we invite you to stay around and have some pie. You will be duly impressed. These are the best pie makers in Wilmington. Uh, and enjoy the pie. And please take some time to look at the collection. Don't forget to put on your white gloves and uh, really try to absorb, as Kathleen said, Wilmington's history. Thank you.